Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this Wednesday morning. A very warm welcome to the first ever webinar for the iconic voices from MIT. I'm Corina Chung, Senior Director for Marketing and Communications at SUTD, and I am your MC today. In the last 10 years as Singapore's fourth public university, SUTD has emerged top among the world's emerging engineering schools. This year, we launched our fifth undergraduate degree program in design and artificial intelligence, the first of such a program in the world. This is on top of our four current programs, architecture and sustainable design, engineering product development, engineering systems and design, and information systems technology and design. At SUTD, we are proud to incorporate the art and science of technology and design into a multidisciplinary curriculum that seeks to nurture technically grounded leaders and innovators to serve societal needs. As part of SUTD's ongoing mission to inspire and nurture future leaders and innovators passionate about technology and design, the SUTD Iconic Voices from MIT Lecture Series is a unique opportunity that features leading faculty from MIT. As you know, SUTD was originally started with curriculum from MIT. So this series provides a platform for interaction with distinguished get experts in the areas of science, architecture, technology, and design. The past speakers of this series include Dr. Susumo Tonigawa, Nobel Laureate for Medicine, President Emerita of MIT, Dr. Susan Hockfield, and most recently, Dr. Nergis Mavavala, MacArthur Genius Award recipient, whose team made the first ever detections of gravitational waves. The Iconic Voices from MIT Lecture Series is proudly sponsored by the Far East organization. So our speaker today is Professor Feng Zhang, the James and Patricia Poitrius Professor of Neuroscience at MIT, a, mole a molecular biologist, Professor Zhang is a core member of the Broad Institute and an investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. He is also a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Zhang played an integral role in the development of two revolutionary technologies, optogenetics, and CRISPR-Cas systems, including pioneering the use of Cas9 for genome editing and discovering CRISPR-Cas12 and Cas13 systems and developing them for therapeutic and diagnostic applications. His seminal work provided the foundation for CRISPR-based medicines and his discoveries continue to fuel the clinical translation of CRISPR technologies. In addition, he developed the diagnostic platform Sherlock, which is being leveraged to help monitor infectious diseases, including the recent corona outbreak, coronavirus outbreak. So the topic for today's lecture is the future of medical innovation, genome editing tools where he will discuss how natural systems like CRISPR are being harnessed to change how we treat diseases and improve human health. The format will comprise of a 45-minute lecture followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. So feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A function and we will discuss them later. With that, it is now my pleasure to welcome Professor Feng Zhang. Professor, please. Great. Um, thank you, Karina, for the introduction. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate in the SUTD forum. Uh, it's a great honor to 
be able to tell you about some of the work that uh, my lab has been working on uh, to develop genome editing technologies and applications uh, for therapeutics and also for diagnostics. So let me share my, my slides. Okay, great. So one of the most exciting advances over the past decade in biology uh, has been the development of uh, DNA sequencing technology. Uh, more than 10 years ago, the entire human genome uh, was sequenced. And what that means is that we now know the different DNA letters that compose our genome. The human genome is very large. It's 3 billion letters long. And so it's a, it's a very long string of four different letters, A, T, G, and C. And the first human genome that was completed more than 10 years ago uh, was very expensive, cost hundreds of millions of dollars to complete. But since then, the technology for sequence DNA has decreased exponentially. And so nowadays, it's possible to uh, sequence a new uh, human genome for less than $1,000 and is rapidly approaching uh, to, be one, uh, to be lower than $100. So what you see on this picture here are the different uh, chromosomes that are in our cells. And so using these DNA sequencing technologies, it's possible to read every letter on each one of these uh, chromosomes. So as the, as the DNA sequencing technology improves and the cost decreases, uh, scientists and also uh, physicians are able to sequence the genomes of many, many individuals. And by comparing the DNA sequences between different individuals, and especially comparing between groups of individuals that are at very high risk or are affected by specific diseases with the DNA from individuals who are not affected by those diseases. Those comparisons can allow people to identify specific DNA differences that underlie these different diseases. And so to date, uh, by sequencing uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, different genomes, uh, scientists have begun to discover uh, more than 6,000 genetic differences that can lead to devastating and harmful diseases. On this slide are just three of the different examples where scientists have identified the causative genetic difference. Sickle cell disease is one example, uh, cystic fibrosis, or different forms of eye degeneration. These are all what people call monogenic or rare genetic diseases. They are very grievous. Uh, they affect small numbers, numbers of people, and they are caused by a very specific identifiable gene that is mutated uh, in the DNA of these patients. The difference between any two individuals can be very uh, numerous. Uh, in fact, there, can, there can be more than a million uh, different uh, uh, letters between any two individuals' genomes. So not all those differences are necessarily harmful. Uh, in fact, some uh, scientists have identified to be potentially uh, protective or reduce the risk for certain diseases. A mutation in the gene called CCR5 can prevent HIV viruses from infecting uh, those individuals who have that mutation. Um, other mutations uh, in, in the APOE gene uh, reduces risk for Alzheimer's disease. And they're also rapidly develop, uh, sort of discovering uh, many new mutations that uh, reduce uh, cardiovascular disease or reduce diabetes and so forth. And so the picture that is emerging is that the genome contains many, many different uh, DNA sequences. Some of them contribute to disease risk. Some of them reduce disease risk. And so if we can start to understand what are the bad mutations and what are the potentially uh, beneficial mutations, then a tantalizing idea is, can we introduce these mutations into um, a patient who is affected by a certain disease and be able to treat those diseases, or to be able to directly correct a specific disease causing mutation, revert it back to what is found in healthy individuals so that we can also uh, treat those diseases? Or can we take the mutations in people who have low disease risk for cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's disease, introduce it to people who are at high risk, and then be able to reduce uh, their disease risk? 
and, and improve their overall um, uh, duration of, of health span. So all these would rely on technologies that allow us to go into the genome and be able to make specific changes uh, to the DNA. And so how do we go about doing that? Well, the human genome is composed of these chromosomes, 23 pairs of different chromosomes. If you zoom in to one of these uh, chromosomes, by the way, this is an artist rendering of what a chromosome uh, looks like. You see that the chromosome is just a long string of DNA sequences. It's just four letters, A, T, G, and C, and it recurs in different combinations for, uh, for about three billion times within the whole human genome. If one were just to look at these DNA sequence letters, um, it's hard to really make sense of what they do. But the work of many scientists have begun to annotate and also provide um, an understanding of what these different sequences mean. So now, if you go on to a, uh, a biologist tool like the genome browser, what you will see is that uh, the genome, that long stream letter, is actually consisting of different cassettes. Each cassette regulates the function of a specific gene in the genome. And the human genome has many, many genes. And so that means there are many, many different cassettes that are, are uh, sort of encoded by our DNA genome. Each one of these cassettes um, is um, consisting of different elements. Uh, there's something called a promoter, an enhancer, the gene itself, and the terminator. And a promoter, enhancer, and terminator serve to modify the function of the gene to tell the cell, do we want to turn this gene on? Do we want to turn it off? And if we turn it on, how much do we want to modulate the expression of that gene? So an analogy for this, since we're talking about a long stream of letters, is let's consider a book. Uh, a book is also a long stream of letters. It's parsed into different chapters and paragraphs and, and different sentences. And that's what these gene structures are essentially uh, like. And so each one of these gene structures uh, can be compared with a sentence. A promoter is simply a verb that tells the gene what to do. A enhancer is an adjective. It tells the gene to be expressed a lot or expressed very little. And then the terminator is like a punctuation mark. It tells the cell, where does this gene stop? And so by interpreting these different instructions, uh, the cell is able to read the genome and then be able to interpret that genetic instruction to be able to carry out the function. So mutations that occur in the gene or in the gene cassettes are just like typos that you would find uh, in a given uh, sentence. And so to fix these, um, if we're uh, writing a document, it's, it's fairly simple to do this in Microsoft Word. You open up the find and replace function. You can type in the typo that you're trying to find. And then you can, uh, and, and then the search function will bring the cursor of the document to exactly that position. And then you can backspace to delete. You can type in the new word that you want to replace it with. So it's a very simple process. But the question for biologists is, what is the alternative? What is, what is the equivalent of this um, that would function inside of the, the protein and the DNA environment of a cell? This is where um, the CRISPR genome editing technology comes in. CRISPR was initially um, figured out using, uh, uh, from bacteria that are used to make yogurt. Uh, it's an adaptive immune system. It allows the bacteria to remember previous viruses that have infected those bacteria, remember a small a signature of it so that the next time that virus infects the bacteria, these CRISPR systems can use those, memorize the signatures to recognize the virus and then destroy it. So to, to defend the bacterial cells from these viruses. And so folks in the, in the dairy industry have been using this powerful CRISPR system to immunize bacteria against viruses so that for the starter cultures that people use to make yogurt or make other dairy products, they can pre-immunize them with a virus, basically vaccinate them, and then prevent a large fermentation tank full of uh, dairy product from spoiling uh, when, when a virus uh, gets in there. It's this same immune system and, and some components of it that we have been able to harness to facilitate a genome editing. And so, so this is just another picture showing how the CRISPR system works. On the bottom, this, this mountain-like structure 
is a bacterial cell. And, and in nature, there can be many viruses, uh, these little um, um, sort of uh, spherical globs with a string attached to the bottom. Uh, each one of these is a different virus. And these viruses latch onto the bacterial cell and they inject their genetic information into the bacterial cell. This is how it infects and replicates and, and then spread uh, this virus uh, throughout the bacterial population. So CRISPR systems destroy the DNA that these uh, viruses inject into the bacterial cell. So one of the systems that we have been um, harnessing is this system called Cas9. It's something that you can reprogram using an RNA guide to introduce it into the human uh, nucleus, into a human cell, and program this protein to recognize and search along the DNA until it finds a specific sequence that we want to edit. So this RNA, which is in red, matches with DNA. And if it matches, then we have, a, we have found the mutation and the enzyme will make a cut in the DNA. That cut is the equivalent of the cursor. So one of the ways the cell repairs this cut is by making a small change and then re-gluing the two DNA ends together. This introduces a mutation and then it's very useful for inactivating a gene that is deleterious in the cell. So if you want to get rid of something, you can just cut it and, it, and, and the cell uh, takes care of it and gets rid of it. The alternative is to fix a mutation. And one of the ways to do this is by providing the cell with another piece of uh, DNA. This is something that you can chemically synthesize uh, very easily. Um, and so this DNA carries uh, ends that are, that are similar to the broken DNA and it allows uh, the cell uses this DNA to then incorporate a new sequence to restore a mutation uh, back to its natural form uh, within the genome. So these are the two ways that by using this CRISPR-Cas9 system, we can go and find a specific spot on the DNA, cleave it, and then we can either inactivate a gene that we don't want to have in the cell, or we can replace a DNA sequence with a new sequence to be able to restore the function within that cell. And so um, this is how the, the, the methodology works. And then one of the really exciting applications is the use of this for uh, developing human therapeutics. There are two um, general approaches that um, uh, different drug developers are now using to develop CRISPR into a, a drug. And the first way is called ex vivo therapy. Um, this is being used to treat sickle cell disease um, and, and also different forms of cancer. The way this works is you remove cells from the body of, of a patient. This could be either uh, bone marrow cells or blood stem cells, uh, or it could be immune cells uh, from the blood of the patient. By correcting a mutation, like in the case of sickle cell, and then re-implanting those corrected cells back into the patient, you can restore uh, normal um, uh, red blood cell generation in those patients to the treat sickle cell disease. For cancer, what people do is that they engineer the immune cells by inserting uh, something that allows the immune cell to recognize tumor cells and then be able to latch on and, and then destroy the tumor cells. And so both of these approaches um, work by taking cells from a patient out into a petri dish, modifying it in the petri dish. This is called ex vivo modification. And then putting the, the modified cells back into the patient in order to be able to treat the disease. So this is very powerful, but um, you cannot do ex vivo treatment for, for every tissue in the body. You can't remove the brain or remove uh, the, the, the lung and then fix it and then put it back. And so to, to fix other tissues in the body, um, scientists and, and, uh, and drug developers use what's called in vivo uh, gene editing uh, therapy. And the way this works is by di directly delivering um, the, the Cas9 enzyme and the guide RNA that has been programmed to mediate the gene editing uh, directly into a specific organ or by systemically injecting into the patient so that this virus uh, carrying um, the, the CRISPR uh, material to deliver it into different tissue can get into the right uh, cells and then be able to restore the function. And, and there are clinical trials underway now uh, where scientists have injected CRISPR uh, reagents into the eye of patients who suffer from eye degeneration to be able to try to uh, help uh, reduce uh, the, the devastation of, of these uh, uh, sort of retinal uh, or eye degeneration uh, disorders. 
so those are um, some of the, th those are two of the main ways that scientists are, are developing treatments for different diseases. And here is just a list of some of these uh, genetic diseases that scientists are now working very actively to try to develop um, CRISPR-based approaches or genome editing-based approaches uh, to be able to treat. This is just a very short list, and there are many, many more. And, uh, and scientists also continue to discover more as they sequence more and more uh, people's DNA and be able to analyze for mutations that cause disease. And so the hope is that over a, long, over a period of time, we'll be able to turn this gene editing approach into a, a powerful platform where as soon as a new disease mutation is identified, people can quickly reprogram the genome editing system, Cas9, to then target this new mutation and to be able to fix it and, and be able to uh, restore health uh, in these patients. So um, one of the really exciting uh, development uh, was reported um, late last year, uh, where a biotech company called CRISPR Therapeutics, uh, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, showed that uh, they used uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to fix bone marrow cells in, in people who suffer from a beta thalassemia. And then after fixing it, and then reinfusing those uh, corrected cells back into those patients, uh, the patients became transfusion free. And so, so they no longer, so these sickle cell disease um, affected uh, patients no longer have to go to the hospital to get a blood transfusion, which uh, without the therapy, they would have to go on, uh, on a sort of fairly regular basis in order to be able to manage their disease and condition. And so, so this is a very exciting uh, development because it's a single uh, treatment that, that is achieving a very long lasting uh, effect. And they're continuing to carry out the clinical trial and the, and the uh, readout of these patients and things are looking uh, very promising um, uh, for using CRISPR uh, as a uh, effective uh, treatment for this uh, devastating disease. So those are all the really powerful things, but, um, there are, but because this technology is so powerful, there are also uh, areas where uh, we have to sometimes take pause. And, uh, and one of these areas is the ethical challenges that are posed uh, by uh, these genome editing technologies. Um, back in 2008, um, around November, uh, it was reported that um, a Chinese researcher uh, used gene editing to modify the DNA of human embryos, and then those human embryos were then um, uh, re-implanted back into a mother, uh, into their mother, uh, so that um, two baby girls uh, who had their genes edited were born. Uh, this uh, caused an international um, uh, uproar, uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, discussions have, have gone on since then uh, about all of the ethical um, um, challenges that, that are facing the application of um, genome editing in modifying human germ cells, those cells that give rise, uh, that, that are, are in the reproductive uh, system that, that can give rise to uh, new, um, newborn uh, babies. And, uh, and those are mutations that will get passed on from generation to generation. So there are many, many different um, uh, reasons why we shouldn't be practicing this. And, and uh, uh, last year, uh, me and a number of different researchers, we, we called for a, a, a moratorium around the use of genome editing for, uh, for editing human babies. And, uh, and, uh, and so far, um, I think uh, there is uh, consensus around the, the international community uh, that we shouldn't be uh, proceeding uh, with using genome editing uh, for, for embryo editing yet, um, as, as we, uh, we need to understand a lot more and also to think through uh, the ethical implications uh, before we, we take any step uh, forward. Besides uh, in the area of human health, um, there are also a lot of other applications, uh, especially in biotechnology. Uh, one of the areas is in agriculture, where just like with identifying human uh, disease-causing mutations, uh, scientists who are sequencing or mapping the DNA of plants have now started to identify many mutations that are potentially conferring insect resistance or drought resistance or able to increase the yield of agricultural crops. And by identifying these different genetic mutations, it's then possible to use gene editing to introduce them uh, in a rapid and systematic way to engineer new generations of uh, agricultural uh, crops that can um, provide better solutions 
for making the world more sustainable and also producing more food supply to be able to feed the world. And this is a much more um, rapid and much faster than traditional crossing and breeding because traditionally the way you would uh, combine these mutations is you take a crop that has one desirable trait and another crop with another desirable trait and you cross them and let them breed naturally. And that takes multiple generations of crossing in order to get to the final uh, desirable uh, species that has everything combined together. But with genome editing, you can do it much faster because you can put, introduce all these different changes uh, at once into, um, into a plant cell, and then that can give rise to a new crop. And so this provides uh, another way for, um, for agriculture to, to accelerate and also to be able to meet the challenges that we're now facing, especially uh, in light of uh, global warming. So there are a couple of examples of uh, genetically modified uh, crops that have already been re uh, released. Uh, one of them is a non-browning mushroom. Uh, you, uh, you may remember that sometimes for certain types of mushroom, if you take it out and place it uh, uh, in the room, uh, and especially if you cut it open, it starts to turn brown. And so there are changes in the DNA of these mushrooms that you can make that prevent them from, from turning brown. Uh, there are also uh, soybean seeds that have been edited so that they produce more oleic acid. And this is uh, a property that is desirable. It makes these soybeans uh, healthier. And so these are just some examples. And there are many, many other applications uh, that uh, scientists in the, in the food agricultural industry are, are now uh, applying gene editing to, to produce. And overall, uh, it will help us to then be able to increase the yield and hopefully make farming uh, more, much more sustainable. So Cas9 is just one of the many examples of uh, powerful uh, microbial systems that live, uh, that, that can be found in the organisms that live in the diverse environment that, that uh, surround us. And this is a picture from the Yellowstone National Park. And as you look at these diverse terrain and, and geothermal vents and, and the lakes uh, and, and different uh, soil uh, types, there are all sorts of different bacteria that live in them. And so by looking into the microorganisms that live in these environments, uh, you can find very powerful uh, molecular machines like Cas9 uh, that can be potentially uh, used uh, to improve uh, human health and, and also uh, improve uh, uh, our, our ways of living. Um, so besides Cas9, we have been um, lo looking for other systems as well. Uh, and Cas13 is just another example of a CRISPR protein that we found uh, from, from other types of bacteria. Cas13, unlike Cas9, uh, targets RNA instead of DNA. And so what we were able to do is to use this Cas13 molecule to turn it into a diagnostic uh, technology. And the way this works is you have the Cas13 protein, which is here in purple. You load it with the RNA that's been programmed to recognize a virus RNA that's shown here in blue. So once the red uh, programmed RNA recognizes virus RNA, it activates this protein and this protein can go and cleave reporter molecules like these. Once it's cleaved, it gives off a glow, uh, or it can be applied onto a paper strip so that a new line shows up uh, on the paper strip. And so as you flow the sample, the cleaved reporters will bind to the paper strip, and then the result is that you see a line showing up on the paper strip, and that will tell you that um, the sample uh, contains the virus that you're trying to look for. So this is... Um, um, the format is kind of like a pregnancy test or an or a antigen test uh, for COVID-19, uh, but essentially it's using this CRISPR-based uh, way to detect a virus RNA within these uh, uh, human uh, samples. So this is just, just another um, picture of what, what it may look like in the laboratory. Each one of these uh, dipsticks is one paper strip, and you can see the samples that contain the virus sequences that we're looking for a line shows up on these uh, paper strips. So, so this is still very much the tip of iceberg. Um, scientists are racing to sequence more and more of the biological diversity uh, that exists in our world. Uh, just as of uh, 2018, uh, there are over 160,000 uh, genomes that have been sequenced. And now this is continues to grow exponentially. So the, the message is really that uh, there are many, many more uh, useful and powerful uh, databases uh, that we can uh, study 
and, and from there we can identify uh, interesting and also useful uh, molecular uh, machineries from these natural diversity to be able to develop therapeutics and diagnostics and, and uh, useful uh, biotechnologies. So um, last but not least, um, we're continuing to develop um, uh, from these microbial diversity and, and biological diversity molecules that have therapeutic uh, potentials. Uh, we're also uh, developing ways to be able to deliver them uh, into different tissues in the body so that we can address specific diseases. And then, and then we are working on uh, testing to see, can we apply these in animal models uh, or in uh, disease models? Uh, and can, they, can these uh, therapeutic approaches achieve enough efficacy uh, to be able to make uh, a, a important impact uh, in these uh, uh, diseases? And, uh, and, and finally, uh, just want to acknowledge uh, my team um, at MIT and the Broad Institute uh, who have been working with me to develop uh, these uh, uh, really interesting projects and also technologies. And they are a group of really uh, talented and also uh, very uh, uh, passionate uh, young scientists uh, who I, I am very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with. So, um, so that's all, thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, thank you, Professor Feng Zhang, for your sharing on the groundbreaking work and cutting across both humans as well as um, plants. So that is really fantastic, Professor Zhang. So uh, joining us, it will also be uh, as moderator, our head of SUTD's engineering product development pillar and Chan Man Chet Professor, Professor Ch Chua Chi Kai. Professor Chua heads SUTD's uh, focus area in healthcare, which applies SUTD's interdisciplinary education and research to the challenges we face in the healthcare industry. During the COVID-19 pandemic, SUTD has over 19 projects targeted at this uh, pandemic situation alone. So without further ado, uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. I see that there are already some questions in the chat. And I will now hand over the session to Prof Chua to moderate the Q&A session. Over to you, Prof Chua. Thank you, Corina. Uh, thank you, Professor Chang, for that very inspiring talk. So right now for the Q&A session, um, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So I'll start with the first one. Do you have any comments about the risk of prion diseases with the use of in vitro cultured treatment? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think that that is, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, so Prion diseases are, are spread by um, you know, prions that can uh, amplify the misfolded protein within, uh, within the body. And so in terms of in vitro culture treatment, um, in order for there to be a prion disease risk, there has to be prions uh, in those uh, cultures in the first place. And, uh, and I think um, that is an important thing to, to check. But I think for the ex vivo treatments that I have been talking about, where you are editing um, uh, either bone marrow cells or blood stem cells uh, or, or T cells, um, I, I, I don't think there are prions in those cells. And so um, there's probably not so much a prion risk for, for that. Uh, but certainly if you are um, uh, you transplanting material that may contain prions, that, that is certainly an important uh, risk factor. Thank you, Prof Chan. Um, so let me move on to the next one. Is there a risk of therapeutic CRISPR system turning normal cells into rock or malignant cells? If there's such a risk, how do you mitigate it? This is a really important question for the development of CRISPR-based therapeutics. Um, one of the things about genome editing is that we know it can go and edit what you want to change, but we also know that um, early versions of these systems can go and introduce unwanted mutations uh, in specific places in the genome. And if those unwanted mutations happen to land into a gene uh, that, uh, that is, for example, an oncogene, 
uh, and can cause a, uh, the cell to proliferate and become a tumor, uh, then there is a certain amount of risk. So what uh, scientists and, and, uh, and biotechs that are developing uh, CRISPR-based medicine is that they are taking a multi-pronged approach to make sure that they can minimize the off-target editing or unwanted mutation risk. They do this by engineering um, the enzyme to make the enzymes more specific. So they are less likely to bind and modify uh, a sequence that is not perfectly matching uh, the programmed uh, guide RNA. Uh, they are um, developing and optimizing the, the mode of delivery so that they can limit the duration of time that a cell is exposed to these editing machinery. And then finally, they are um, carefully selecting target sites in these genes so that those sites are as unique as possible throughout the genome so that there's a much lower chance of that target site uh, being um, sort of closely resembling some other place within the genome to lead to an off target. And so, so far, um, the, the data have been looking um, uh, very promising and, and the clinical trial data uh, have also uh, been looking very promising. Uh, but uh, it is worth noting that these are it's still very much early days for this therapy. And, uh, and some of these long-term effects we are not going to know until we're, we have had, uh, say, a decade of time to observe. Uh, but um, the drug developers and, and also the, the uh, clinical trialists are paying very close attention to these uh, to, to make sure that, that we really fully understand uh, the system. Okay, thanks, Prof. Chan. Uh, next question. Could the CRISPR... Cas9 editing system be used to correct chromosomal translocations? Um, so chromosomal translocations are one of many different types of mutations. Um, I think right now, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 based systems are, are, are best uh, for making small changes rather than chromosomal translocations, uh, which are much larger rearrangements uh, in, the, in the genome. Um, so I, th I think new technologies will need to be developed in order to be able to correct those uh, translocation changes in, in the DNA. Okay, on the topic of mutation, uh, will virus develop a resistance to CRISPR when they mutate? Um, so so the, the CRISPR-based therapies are, are, are currently being de uh, developed not for treating virus infections, uh, but for treating uh, genetic diseases. So, so not targeting areas that are rapidly evolving. Uh, but the CRISPR system can uh, accommodate or tolerate uh, small numbers of mutations. And this is how bacteria are able to um, uh, basically uh, evolve or, or to be able to adapt to viruses that are rapidly evolving. So even when a virus mutates one base, um, it, it still cannot uh, escape the CRISPR immune system. Uh, and, and that I think is, is a, it's a double-edged sword. It means that CRISPR can have off-target uh, activity uh, if there is only one base pair of mismatch, but it also means that uh, in a defense immunity environment, um, single base changes uh, will not be able to escape the, the immunity. Okay, the next question is mine. One of my favorite movies is the X-Men. So I'd like to find out from you, uh, is it a myth that uh, genome editing can one day make superhumans like X-Men? <laughs> I think that's a good question. I, I, think, um, uh, I think what genome editing can be used uh, or are being developed right now is to be able to treat diseases, um, to be able to uh, fix things that uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't even imagine a treatment for uh, in the past. And I think that's pretty super powerful um, because it's, it's allowing us to be able to help make people's lives better and, uh, and that's, that's what uh, CRISPR is being used to do. Um, things that you may be thinking about, um, magnetosensation or, or X-ray vision, um, we, we don't really know the biology uh, or, or uh, things like that. You have to know how to change the genome uh, before you can actually use something to ch change the genome. So I think that's, that's very much science fiction rather than, uh, than what you can actually use the CRISPR system to do. Okay, thanks for debunking the myth. All right, this gentleman is particularly interested to get your opinion about gene delivery vectors, for example, AAV, Lantivira, etc. So his questions are, to what extent are the current state-of-the-art vectors limiting breakthroughs in delivering in vivo gene therapies? 
And second question is, are you familiar with RNA transplicing vectors as a novel non-viral gene vector? Right. Um, so this is also a, uh, a really key point about the development of uh, CRISPR-based medicine. Um, there are two ways that people are using uh, gene editing for treating disease. There's ex vivo therapy and there's in vivo therapy. Ex vivo is much easier to do because we're taking cells out of the body and there are many ways to put the gene editing machineries into those cells uh, once they're in a petri dish. But in the body, this is where the viral vectors come in. Um, Cas9 is, is, a, is a large molecule. And so the best way to put it into different cells in the body is by using natural uh, mechanisms for delivering things into those cells, uh, which, are, uh, which are like viruses. So the current viral vectors are, are based on AAV or lentiviruses. AAV is probably the most uh, widely used uh, gene delivery vector uh, to date. Uh, AAV is compact, so that means you can only package uh, you can barely package uh, Cas9 alone uh, into a, a single AAV vector, and that limits uh, the amount of uh, things that you can deliver into a cell. So, so folks um, in, in the viral delivery field have been developing um, new viral-based approaches, uh, whether it's increasing the cargo capacity or, uh, or uh, using these uh, you know, so-called trans-splicing uh, vectors to be able to um, put two vectors in and then allow each vector to package half of the, uh, of the uh, information. And then once both viruses get into the same cell, they can be combined together to reconstitute uh, the complete information. So these are all different strategies uh, that, that people are developing. I think that the biggest uh, hurdle right now is being able to scale the manufacturing of these viral-based vectors. Um, they are generally very expensive uh, to produce and also um, in order to treat um, human adults, you need to make a lot of these viruses. And sometimes the dose that, that needs to be administered is so uh, large that you, it, it will cost millions of dollars to even produce enough for treating one, uh, one patient. And that's the cost. So, so these are the things that really need uh, continued uh, development. And, and I think there are a lot of interesting strategies uh, such as mRNA delivery or lipid nanoparticles that are starting to show promise uh, for some organs like the liver. And, um, and, and I think in the next decade, this is an area that, uh, that we really need to make more breakthroughs in uh, in order to be able to fully realize uh, the potential for gene, ba uh, gene editing based therapy. Okay, thanks. Uh, this next question has quite a lot of uh, people asking, has CRISPR-Cas9 editing system been explored in the use editing the enhancer? or promoter of the genetic sequence in order to control the gene expression that controls cell cycle signaling or apoptosis for cancer treatments? Yeah, so um, these are really great ideas. And, um, and in fact, it's, it's being explored in the therapeutic context. Um, the clinical trial that I mentioned uh, where uh, researchers have targeted um, the genome to be able to treat sickle cell disease, that is done by modulating an enhancer um, that modulates the expression of a gene called BCL11A. By changing the expression level of this enhancer, uh, you can then uh, elevate the expression of fetal hemoglobin. So it's kind of an uh, indirect way of achieving the desired outcome. And, uh, and so this is very much um, sort of a strategy that people are using. Now, the challenge of this is that um, basically you need to have a lot of different um, uh, understanding of regulators and enhancers and, uh, and in order to be able to, um, to uh, treat these diseases, we need to know more about the regulatory biology uh, within, within cells. All right, um, let me move on. Sorry, the, um, the questions are moving up and down. <laughs> so it's quite difficult to... All right, do you have any comments uh, let me see. Is there a risk of the therapeutic CRISPR system turning normal cells? Oh, this has been asked really, sorry. Um, all right. Is it great that gene editing can increase agriculture yield? Are there any health implications on people who consume this uh, gene edited food? So it's probably about uh, GMO food. 
Yeah, oh. this is a really uh, this is really important question. So, so gene editing and GMO are uh, are not necessarily the same thing. So, GMO is usually created by introducing something that is that is foreign into a new organism. For example, introducing a new gene uh, that will make a new protein product in in those uh, plants. Um, gene editing, on the other hand, is usually done by by combining naturally occurring mutations. So for example, to make a drought resistant plant, um, uh, the scientists will look at uh, genetic differences between two different, uh, crop, uh, two different uh, plants. Uh, the one that is uh, drought resistant, they will take the specific genetic differences from those plants um, and introduce it into another plant to basically transfer that drought resistance property into that new plant um, without having to introduce entire genes. Uh, and, and this is something that you would get um, by crossing uh, these two plants. So, so the end product of a genome edited plant is no different than what you would get through traditional agricultural um, crossing and breeding. Uh, the only difference is that the genome edited plant, you can get it a lot sooner uh, than, than uh, crossing and breeding a, a new uh, plant a product. So, so, so from, from a health perspective, it shouldn't really have any consequence um, uh, to, to the person who's consuming it. All right, thanks. I see these two questions. It's about off-target effects. So first one, how do we detect and deal with off-target effects in treatments given that some clinical trials like the Cambridge study have already targeted stem cells in a bone marrow? Um, so uh, the way that so, so off-target is, is something that um, the, the people who are developing clinical trials uh, pay a lot of attention to. Um, they take multiple different approaches uh, and combine them to make sure that this, the therapy is safe. The first is that they do um, what I mentioned earlier, uh, engineering the protein to make it more specific, controlling the duration that these enzymes are, are introduced into the cell and then also selecting target sites in the genome that are very, very unique. But in addition to that, they also do many, many rounds of experiment in many, many cells to quantify the level of off-target activity that is seen. And they also check to see where are these off-targets. Um, the off-target that are exhibited by the CRISPR system, Cas9 system, are reproducible off-targets. So that means there are not random off-targets that changes every single time. They're always hitting the same thing. And so the, the drug developers can also verify that the mutations, the off-target mutations that are introduced, if there is any, and usually there, there isn't any, but if there is one, uh, does it have a deleterious effect? Is it hitting an a oncogene or is it hitting a tumor suppressor gene? And, and so a lot, all that evaluation is done uh, before um, the the guide RNA is, is uh, defined uh, to be able to go into a clinical trial. Okay, still on the same subject of uh, off-target edits, um, this gentleman wants to know how dangerous are these edits and um, whether uh, is there anything the current techniques can be adopted to minimize the, um, the risk? So um, the 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 way that genome editing is being applied to treating disease is not um, usually right now is to reverse it back to what is seen in, um, in the people who are not affected by the, that disease. So, so it's, it's simply uh, restoration of a genetic uh, difference uh, into uh, a different form. And so, so that in itself is not dangerous. Um, it can potentially become risky uh, when, the, when there is chance for off-targeting, uh, off-target editing, but those are the things that, that um, one would really have to uh, carefully um, uh, test and also minimize in order to reduce that risk. All right, next question is, how is the sensitivity and specificity of CAS13 uh, for detecting viral RNA as compared to conventional PCR? How complicated is the sample processing before it can be loaded to your Cas13 system? 
any application in COVID-19 testing? Right, so, uh, so the CRISPR-based diagnostics uh, like Sherlock uh, had been uh, developed for COVID-19 testing. Uh, the way it, it works is, is you uh, obtain a nasal swab, usually an anterior nearest swab. Um, the swab, which has a virus, is then dipped into a lysis buffer. And this lysis buffer carries uh, enzymes, proteases to degrade the protein uh, so that um, the RNA will get uh, released from the virus. And it's that uh, release RNA that you can then add into the CRISPR reaction. The CRISPR reaction has two steps. The first is uh, isothermal amplification using either things like uh, RPA or using LAMP-based amplification. And then afterwards, you add in the CRISPR protein to be able to um, check to see if the virus sequence is present. And you can read it out using fluorescence or using paper strip-based uh, assays. The sensitivity um, is, is pretty good. Uh, you can generally get to a sensitivity of about, um, say, 500 copies to 1,000 copies of input into a reaction. And compared to RTQPCR, uh, these can, can be quite comparable in terms of uh, sensitivity. The specificity uh, of CRISPR-based reaction is very good uh, because you are doing two rounds of detection. Um, the isothermal amplification is done through sequence-specific primer targeting the virus sequence. After we amplify it, uh, sometimes there could be background um, sort of false positive amplification, but you can get rid of that false positive signal by then adding in the CRISPR protein to look for the virus sequence again. And, and by doing both, um, you can really minimize uh, or eliminate uh, these false positive signals. And so the so net result is a, is a sensitive and also um, a accurate uh, test. All right, this question is about the mosquito, something which we are very much uh, affected in Singapore. So this gentleman is asking, what are your thoughts to leverage CRISPR-based gene editing to confer anthropod vectors resistance against virus? For example, confer Aedes mosquitoes resistance against flavi viruses so that we can potentially hot transmission of every viral diseases. Right, so, uh, so one thing that I didn't mention in my talk is a very powerful um, technology called gene drive. And, uh, and this is a hotly debated uh, approach uh, for uh, controlling um, uh, sort of pathogen vectors such as mosquitoes. Uh, the idea is that you would um, edit, you introduce a gene drive uh, into um, a, uh, a mosquito, and then when that mosquito breeds with other mosquitoes, this gene drive uh, gets transmitted to all their offsprings. And so if the gene drive is something that prevents uh, or, or renders the mosquito sterile, uh, then after you know, a round of uh, breeding, uh, then all the offsprings will become sterile, and then, and then uh, they would no longer be able to um, sort of continue to reproduce the population. And so this is a powerful approach that uh, some people have been considering uh, for, uh, for, say, reducing the mosquito population uh, to, um, to sort of conquer uh, malarial diseases. Uh, but, but it's also a very challenging system to deploy into nature because um, a major concern is that what if you cannot control uh, the spread of this vector? Um, and, and also, if you are going to wipe out the entire species, um, what will be the ecological consequences of that uh, action. Uh, these are things that are very difficult to, to predict. Uh, but other researchers are uh, working on trying to make the technology more controllable. Uh, things that can, uh, or ways of engineering an on-off switch into these gene drives so that you can control the extent to which they're active. Uh, so I think, the, I think it's a very interesting and, and very um, uh, powerful area that has been developed. But of course, the application of any version of these technologies uh, really requires a very careful thought, um, uh, especially in terms of uh, the ethics of that uh, before it should be uh, deployed in, in the wild. Mm -hmm. All right, this person wants to know the minimum number of cells that need to be modified that is uh, duplicated by case 9 in vivo in order to have a meaningful impact on disease. That's a, that's a tricky question uh, because the number of cells that you need to modify really depends on the disease you're trying to treat. 
um, diseases of the immune system, uh, in theory, it's possible uh, that you can treat it by correcting just one uh, bone marrow stem cell. If you treat, if you correct one hematopoietic uh, stem cell, that cell, uh, if it's able to be successfully engrafted back in the body, it can re reconstitute the entire immune system. Um, there are other diseases, uh, liver diseases, you may have to correct, uh, say, somewhere around 15 to 20% of cells. Um, and then there are yet other diseases where you probably have to get 100% uh, of cells, like, uh, like uh, in, in, in uh, uh, some forms of tumor. So, so it really depends on what kind of disease uh, one is trying to treat. All right, um, I'm mindful of the time, so perhaps I will probably give you two more questions, a bit less technical. I believe there are a lot of researchers here who are very interested in your work. So oh. one of them asked, what is the pathway to take in order to be able to do research on things that your team does? Um, I think, uh, so, so the way that we think about approaching these uh, problems is, is we try to first identify a need. Um, so what, what is something that people have wanted to do but have not been able to do? Um, and then once we know what that need is, then we brainstorm about possible solutions. Uh, so for example, if you are thinking about how do we deliver uh, things to the lung, um, one way to, to brainstorm is to think about what are all the things that uh, lung cells will take up? Uh, are there resident natural um, endogenous viruses in the lung that we can uh, discover and, and uh, repurpose for delivering things in the lung? Or are there chemicals that, um, that lung cells are especially susceptible to, uh, to take up? And can we somehow use those chemicals to then bring material into lung cells? So, so we always kind of start with a problem statement and then, uh, and then start to brainstorm solutions. Um, oftentimes we require reading a lot of papers scouring the literature for things that may be relevant. But it's a lot easier to do that once you have a clear problem uh, identified. All right, and uh, finally, as a pioneer in this field, what was your biggest Eureka moment? Um, I, I think it, it's, it's a super exciting field to work in. I think one of the biggest Eureka moments was probably uh, working on developing uh, Cas9 for genome editing. Uh, and then, and then later on, um, you know, discovering, uh, realizing that CRISPR systems are much broader, and then discovering new CRISPR systems, and then now we're working on delivery systems, and then uh, some of it is is about uh, discovering new uh, delivery mechanisms that we can harness and combine with gene editing. So, so I think in science, um, what you what you uh, dream and and yearn for are these eureka moments from time to time. Once you have experienced one, you want to have more. And uh, it's, it, it, in a way, it's addictive because you always want to get a dopamine rush that you get from each one of these Eureka moments. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's part of the fun of doing science, but also um, working with other um, collaborators and, and students and postdocs uh, together to solve problems. Uh, that is also a very, that social aspect of science is also a very, um, very rewarding and, and, and a enjoyable part. Thank you very much, Professor Chang. Um, I'm sorry, audience, I could not make it to, un to ask all the questions that have been posed. So anyway, um, we, we have a very interesting talk with lots of uh, interesting questions. Now I'll hand the time back to you, Corina. Yes, thank you everyone for the variety of interesting questions and uh, insights from Professor Chang and Professor Chua. So uh, as Professor Chang, and Professor Chua has tried their best and Professor Zhang has stayed up late at night from Boston with us. We have now come to the end of the iconic Voices from MIT lecture. So thank you, Professor Zhang, and have a restful evening in Boston. To everyone else, have a great day ahead and we look forward to seeing you again in the next lecture. Thank you very much, everyone.